Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And Carlos, uh, Madeo, much appreciated. And Vicente, thank you so much for inviting us and hosting me and mi mujer, Hallie, who is right here. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. I am so, so thrilled to be speaking with you this evening, although I think you have now heard everything, so there's not much more for me to say. But I will, uh, I will, I will do my best to help you see how the ideas in this book uh, can be useful to you in your society, in your businesses, and in your families, uh, and perhaps most importantly for yourself. So my, my goal here is to give you uh, a bit more background on this approach to leadership from the point of view of the whole person, and to tell you about this idea that I call four way wins. And of course, I will be speaking in English, so I hope that is okay. Um, I know muy, muy poco español. Um, <clears throat> so I will try to speak in a, in a way that uh, you can all follow and uh, look forward to your questions uh, when, I, when I'm done. Um, the idea is to be leading with impact, as Carlos said, in all the different parts of life. And what we have learned from our research uh, covering many different companies, many different kinds of leaders at different life stages uh, and in different parts of society is that these three principles are very important. Authenticity, integrity, and creativity. And so I will explore those with you and ask you to consider what these ideas mean for you. Um, <clears throat> We're, we're going to be active here, and I can see that you have in front of you a sheet of paper. Uh, I hope you all have that, that has, yes, gracias, uh, an assessment that I'm going to ask you to do, uh, which gives you a taste of how this model works and the issues that it helps you to grapple with, to, to address in your own life. And I, I expect that this will make the ideas come to life for you in a way that is relevant uh, for your life. And what my hope is that by the time I am done in this next 45 minutes or so, is that you will have some new ideas, ideas that you can use. Uh, because I, I expect that many of you are thinking, uh, this all sounds wonderful, but I don't see how we can do this here in our country at this time, in my world. And so I, I understand that you are probably skeptical. Most people are, because this sounds utopian. It sounds ideal. How can you have work and home and community and self all work together? Well, there is no magic here. There is no, there's no drugs. <laughs> there's, no, there's no magic solution. There is science. And there is a method that has been refined over many years of work and, and uh, discovery in many different kinds of organizations and different cultural contexts that demonstrate how it is possible to shift how you think about the different parts of life and how they fit together and to make changes that enable you to have more of an impact on the different parts of life that matter to you if you simply try. So what I'm asking of you, what I'm begging of you, is that you will open your mind to the possibility of thinking a little differently. And if you are skeptical about this approach, which I expect many of you are, because I encounter skepticism everywhere I go, in the morning, I have, I have a bowl of oatmeal, and I also have a bowl of skepticism that I eat along with the, uh, with the oatmeal, because it is everywhere, because this model that I'm going to introduce you to here is, is counter to the traditional ways that we think about leadership. So keep your mind open, if you will, and um, you might find some value in these ideas. I want to start, though, by asking you a question. This, this is an approach to leadership and 
as you heard Amadeo say in your very generous introduction, it is also about integrating the different parts of life, right? So when I created this model for the first time, it was based on research that we had been doing at the Wharton School and elsewhere um, that we brought together in a program for change at the Ford Motor Company. So over 15 years ago, I was asked by the chief executive of Ford Motor Company to join the company and to be the senior executive responsible for leadership development on a global basis. So I was responsible for leadership change and development at Ford for uh, almost three years. And <clears throat> the idea was to transform the culture of that 100-year-old company. And this was one of the ways that we did that through an approach to leadership that was different than the approach that had been used in the past. It was different because it was about not just the business person, but the whole person. You are in a period of intense uh, movement in this country, as I have been learning much about over these last couple of days uh, from speaking with so many of you and your colleagues. And so it's important that we begin our conversation here by asking this question, because this is a model of leadership and it is a model of how to integrate the different parts of life for mutual gain. It is both. It is a combination, a marriage of these two fields. That is my main contribution here, is to show how to grow as a leader, one needs to be a whole person and to become a more whole person where the different parts of life work together, one needs to be a good leader. So when I speak about leadership, I'm not speaking about executive authority at the top of, a, of, a, of an organizational pyramid or hierarchy. I'm talking about the person as a leader. So when I look at you, I see a hundred or two hundred or three hundred leaders developing your capacity to produce positive change. What do leaders do? Mobilize people toward valued goals. Now, it's very simple. Mobilizing people toward valued goals. You don't need people underneath you in a hierarchy to do that. You probably know of people who have no one underneath them in the hierarchy who are excellent at leading. And you probably also know, in fact, I'm sure you do, people who are at the tops of organizations who do not know how to lead. See? Oh, no. See? Okay. We did. So now I ask you, in your world, how would you address this question? Just raise your hand. I would like to hear from you. Uh, in a word, una palabra, uh, what kind of leadership do we need now? Senor. Choice. Choice. S a, a leader who creates choice? Exactly. Give people choice. Give people choice. Bueno. What else? Balance. Balance. By that you mean? Okay, balance uh, uh, among the different parts of life. Choice, balance, senor. Emotional uh, involvement, emotional engagement. Emotional engagement, yes, as, as Amadeo pointed out in his uh, introduction, this is about your life, your, you, you know, what, what is inside as well as what is in, outside. Emotional engagement, choice, balance, see? Um, bravery, as in like the person is not shy and he's willing to push like, the ideas forward with confidence? Yes, yes, yes. To create change is to have courage, to try something new because the risk of failure, of course, is always present. Is it, is it only men who are willing to speak? No, of course not, yes. Empower to empower people, to give people the, the sense of courage that's required, the, the ability for them to express their, their particular talents, their energy. 
That, that is a beautiful sound. Who, who is, is that me singing? No, no. Uh, the, uh, to, to empower people. That was the primary goal that we had at Ford Motor Company. When my job description was transform the culture of Ford. <laughs> That's what I had to do. Uh, and, and we made some progress in that. It's a very, very, very difficult challenge to change the culture of a company that has 300,000 people in 80 different countries. Uh, just as it's hard to change the culture of a country or of any organization, it takes a long time. But small steps will help you get there. And the primary uh, challenge for us was how do we get people in our company from the very bottom to the very top to feel like they had power to create positive change. And this approach to leadership that we're talking about here tonight is designed to do that. It is designed to give people a sense of power that they can create change in a way that is good for them and their business life and their family life and their community. What else? Senor. Try to make the rest of the people try to make rest of the people happy in their lives to, to create a world that that enables others to be fulfilled and happy in their in their lives last last point consistent. Consistent across the board. I mean it has to be consistent yes we cannot be performing one way and and um, you know preach the other consistent in word and in action yes all right, we could go on. We could go on. I, I would love to hear from all of you, but, but I won't uh, because we don't have enough time for that. Uh, but this is a good start. So, so what's interesting is to think about how you might have asked or answered this question if I were here 20 years ago or 30 years ago. And I expect that I would hear different things from the audience. Some aspects of leadership will be always important. How do you make people feel good about themselves so that they can contribute fully to your goals as an organization? But there are some things that are new. The landscape for leadership is different now than when I was growing up, than when I first joined Ford Motor Company, or when I first joined the Wharton School over 30 years ago. What is different now? So much has changed, even in the last five years. Just a few things that are that are new. Um, well, I, I will start with this. Is, so this is me holding Gabriel. This uh, that that uh, that you spoke about. That's 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 uh, me and my son 30 years ago, and it was his arrival that, uh, as as you heard in the introduction, that changed how I was thinking about what was important. This led to research that um, that you spoke some about. Uh, in the introduction where we started studying the lives and careers of people uh, at Wharton and elsewhere and in this this book Baby Bust one of the things we found was that uh, when we compared what people who graduated from the Wharton School in 1992 we compared those people to the people who graduated in 2012 so we, we surveyed the, the people as they graduated in 1992. And then 20 years later, we asked the same questions, hundreds of questions about their hopes, their dreams, their aspirations. Same questions to the students graduating uh, just, just a few years ago. So we have a study that is longitudinal. It's historical. It, it covers these two generations, the Gen Xers and the Millennials. One of the things we found was the, uh, the response to the question, do you plan to have or adopt children? Yes, probably. Not sure, probably not. And no were the response alternatives. In 1992, 79% said yes. In 2012, only 42% said yes. And this is a national trend. Young people, men and women, same numbers for men and for women, they don't see how they can make it work. They still want to have families, most of them. They still want to have children of their own, but they, they live in a world where it's increasingly difficult. And it's 
different reasons for men and for women. I don't have time to go into detail on that, but that's just one of the ways that the world has radically changed. Radically changed. Um, the, the digital revolution has changed everything, has it not? I'm just going to check my email here for a second, if you don't mind. Oh, there's a message from one of our children, Allie. Should I respond to that now? No, I should not. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, what was your reaction to my doing that just now? How did you react to my checking my cell phone? How did you feel about what I just did? Anyone? No respect. No respect. Impolite. Impolite. Now, of course, you would never do that, would you? Would you ever do that? Would you ever look at your, your smartphone while you're talking to someone? I, no, of course not. That would be rude. That would be impolite. You do that all the time, probably, if you're like most people now. So, so this is brand new. This is, we have, I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have this. This is brand new. We're just learning how to use the technologies that enable us to communicate with the whole world. Uh, the world is much smaller now in some ways. It is much richer now in some ways. There are more people that have more access to information and education, and yet we're also seeing the climate change. So the world is very, very different now. People have different values. Uh, young people, they don't expect to work in the same company as they as, 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 uh, as they did 20, 30 years ago. Uh, when I first started teaching at Wharton, I would, ask, I would ask people, do you plan to work at the same company when you graduate as when you retire? And so I asked this question at lunch, so don't, you know the answer, so please don't answer. What percentage of, of students do you think said, yes, I plan to work in the same company my whole career in the mid-80s, 30 years ago? What percentage? It was 70, 70%. Now, when I asked this question very recently to a group of students in my leadership class, 70 people sitting in the classroom, I say, raise your hand if you plan to work in the same company your whole career. How many hands do you think went up? Well, there were two, and they were both in a family business. So that was their plan. So the world is very, very different now. And what we did at Wharton uh, 25 years ago, this is the last picture of me that you will see, I promise. But there I am in the center of that New York Times photograph from 20 years ago. We went out into the field and tried to find out how do people do this? How do they bring together the different parts of their lives? Uh, what makes it work for them? And what we discovered was th this model of total leadership, which is a new way of thinking about leadership. It's about mobilizing people toward goals in all the different domains, the ambitos of uh, your life. It is about harmony among the different parts. So balance is how most people talk about work and life. They say balance. So this is balance. The scales are in balance. And so now, my work is going very well. I'm getting more money, more power, more responsibility, more impact through my work. This is wonderful. See? This, 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 I'm, I'm very happy. Estoy feliz. See? What is the problem? ¿Qué, qué es problema? What's the problem? The rest of my life is going down. So when we think about balance, we think about something has to be given in order to something, for something to be gained. And of course, you, we must make choices. We, there are going to be trades. But what I have found is that when you see the world this way, which is how most people see it when they think of work and family and community and themselves, <laughs> they see balance, they think, I have to give something else up. I have to sacrifice. I cannot have this without giving up this. And what I am asking you to think about here is how can you put on a different set of lenses so that you look for opportunities in your life right now? What can you try 
that would make things better, something you haven't done before, that would improve your life at home and at work and in the community, your friends, your neighbors, social groups, and for yourself personally. That is the purpose, to, to look for harmony over the course of your whole life because you can't, this is impossible. So, so I urge you, do not think about balance and instead think about how can you create a sense of harmony over the course of your whole life because balance all at once, I have never seen anyone do that and I've been looking for that for 30 years. It's never happened. You can't have it. So stop thinking about that you can have balance. You cannot, in my opinion. What you can have is a greater sense of harmony over the course of your whole life. So that's what this model is about. Influence, not just top down, but in all the different parts, in all directions, and you are a leader in all the different parts. And the goal is to create change that is meaningful and that can be sustainable, that it can last change that you drive, that you have the power to make happen, and that works because it's not just for you, it's not just for your business, it's not just for your family, it's not just for your community. Your mind is focused on taking action that is good for all the different parts. And so other people want you to succeed. That's the shift in thinking. And it requires these three elements of authenticity, integrity, creativity. The big idea, is that leadership in the business world can no longer be just about business. It has to be about life. So now let's take a look at yours. I'm going to ask you to take a little snapshot. So there you have the piece of paper in front of you. And I sincerely hope that you will all do this. It's muy importante para mí. So, por favor, if you have a pen or a pencil, you will need something to write with. And here we have extra copies if you need it, so just raise your hand if you need a copy. This will just take two minutes, I promise. And I think you will enjoy this. Okay? Ready? Here is what I'm asking you to do. Imagine 100 points. 100 puntos? Uh, percentage. And think about your work your home, your community, yourself. Four ambitos, domains. And how important is each part to you? How much do you care about your work? How much do you care about your family? How much do you care about your community? How much do you care about yourself? So here I am asking you to divide up how important each part is to you. So if your work is everything, so if your boss is sitting next to you, you should say 100, zero, zero, zero. No. <laughs> you say whatever you want. Your values, as best you can, estimate that. If they are all of equal value to you, you would say uh, um, 25, 25, 25, 25. See? Okay. Muy bien. Ahora, in the second column, I'm going to ask you a different question. I want you to think about the focus of your attention. And this is really what this whole model is about. Where is your mind? Where is your mind? Where is your attention? This is your most precious asset as a leader, your attention. What do you devote your attention to? What do you choose to invest in? So in a typical week, aside from sleeping, what percentage of your attention is devoted, is focused on work, on home, on community, and on yourself personally? Now, I know that there is overlapping between these different parts, your family and your community. How are those different? Yourself. Yourself is your mind, your body, your spirit. Uno mismo. 
work, family, community. Imagine those are four separate aspects or roles in your life. Where is your attention devoted in a typical week or a typical month? Okay, is that clear? Ms. Claro? See? Okay, now in the third column, a different question. How do you feel about how things are going for you? How satisfied are you with the different parts of your life on, a, on the scale of one, not at all satisfied, 10, fully satisfied? So for each domain, just circle the number that best describes how you feel, your subjective impression of how you feel about how things are going for you at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself personally. Comprendes? Okay. Finalmente, in the last column, a different question. My last question. If I were to speak to the people who know you best, uh, are they in English? No? Yes? Two? Un poco? Okay, so uh, what is your name? Susana. If, Susana, if I were to speak to the four or five people who know you best at your work, and I were to have a private conversation with them, and I were to ask, how does Susanna perform in meeting your expectations for her? On this scale of one, poor, 10, excellent, on average, Susanna, you don't have to say out loud. <laughs> she said, gracias. Um, actually, she said, thank you. you do, but on average, what do you think they would tell me? I want you all to think about that. Now, you probably have a pretty good idea, at least I hope you do. Now imagine if I were to have the same conversation with the members of your family, and I were to have a private conversation with each one of them, and ask, how is Susanna doing in meeting your expectations for her performance in your family? I know that's a strange way to speak about family life, but people do have expectations of you in your family, do they not? I said, I think they do. I know they do. Well, what would you say? How well are you doing in meeting those expectations? And now imagine your, 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 your friends, your neighbors, people in your religious or social group. What would they say to me on average? How well are you doing in meeting their expectations? And finally, think about your own aspirations, your own goals what you hope to achieve for yourself, your physical health, your emotional health, your spiritual growth, how well are you doing in meeting those expectations? And we will skip the bottom line for now. All right, so are you all now depressed? <laughs> A little sad? Uh, if only it could be better. Well. One thing I know about leaders, good leaders, is they begin with reality. How are things now? How are things really? And so it starts with that. You have to take a, so this is one little quick look at your, what I will call, four-way view. So there you have a snapshot. My guess is that you're starting to think about, well, what does this mean? What does this tell me? How can I learn from this? I hope you're thinking that. Because now I'm going to ask you to have a brief conversation about what you just wrote, if you are willing to have such a conversation. And not with me, but with someone else who's sitting near you. Yes. Now, the, the first and most important part of the, what I ask you to do now is that if you do not want to do this, you do not have to do this. Okay, so seriously, if uh, Amadeo, if you and I were discussion partners just now, and you said to me, 
Well, Stu, this is very interesting, but I don't really want to discuss any of this with you right now. I would say, well, Amadeo, that is unfortunate because I would love to hear from you, um, but that is okay. And I will just talk about myself and that will be fine because as you can tell, I like to talk about myself, probably too much, <laughs> right? Right. All right, so if you don't want to do this, that's fine. But I hope that you will. I mean, you came here to learn something, and that means making yourself a little bit uncomfortable. And perhaps in Spanish culture, it is not, it is not acceptable to discuss such things. And I will su simply suggest to you, just give it a try. See what happens. What do you have to lose? I don't know, your self-respect, your dignity. Um. <laughs> Try to be just a little bit vulnerable here, and I think you will find this to be rewarding. So here is, here is my, my advice to you. I would like you to find, in just one moment, one other person. One person. So this is two people talking, just for five minutes, that's all. So this is not therapy, this is not a, you know, deep, 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 dark disclosures of things that you don't want anyone to know about you. No one's interested in that. Um, well, just a, a very quick initial conversation that asks you with one other person. So, so this is not three people talking. This is not four people talking. This is not five people talking. It's two people. That's all. For five minutes. And here's what I would like you to do. I would like you to address these questions. What are the consequences of the choices you make about the focus of your attention at work, at home, in the community, and for yourself. And what is the greatest challenge that you face? Not time, because most people think, well, if I had more time, but you don't. So, what is the greatest challenge? Maybe it is inside of you, your heart, your head, maybe your fears, uh, uh, or maybe it's the people around you. If only my boss would let me, if only my spouse would let me, if only my parents would let me. So maybe that's where you see the challenge. Where is the challenge? It's probably inside of you. So what is the greatest challenge you face in trying to create what I'm talking about here, a greater sense of harmony. And just listen to your discussion partner for a few minutes, that's all. Now, I have studied coaching for many years, and I've practiced it, and I know that the most important aspect of being a good and effective coach, there's one thing, and that is I have to believe that you care about me if you are going to be helpful to me. So all I ask you to do here is to pay attention to someone else for just a few minutes and to demonstrate that you care about them. And how do you do that? You simply look, th look at them and ask a couple of questions. That's it, that's it. And I expect that you will start to generate some ideas. Ideas that are designed to help you figure out how do I line up, how do I take action that enables me to be closer to my values. <coughs> so that is it. What questions, que preguntas, do you have about what I am asking you to do? Any questions? Preguntas, no? Okay. Begin. Find a partner. One person, we have five minutes now. Are you serious that we got a text from, are you serious that we got a message? No. I didn't say it. No, just making that up. <laughs> you have a partner, find a partner. There's someone back there. You don't want to?
of time. What is the actual time that I have? Well, um, you have to start. Dos minutos, dos minutos más. Ah, muy bien. Presta atención, por favor. Muchas gracias. Okay, so, what, what did you discover? What was it like to have this conversation? I would appreciate any observations or insights from what you what you just did. 
Please raise your hand. Tell me. What insights or observations about what you just did? I will wait. <laughs> Senor. We're surprisingly different. Very, very different. You're surprisingly different. Yeah, very, very different. Which I, I don't think, I mean, do you think everyone is like you, but you know, are completely opposite. It's complete opposite. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, so, so people are different with respect to their values and with respect to where they focus their attention. And that was surprising to you. Yeah. Why was that surprising? He's if my I... brother. <laughs> <laughs> He's your brother. And you expected him to be like you. <laughs> you should give that up, really. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. So thank you. Uh, what, else, what else did you discover? Uh, senor. It seems, oh, sorry. It seems like uh, some of these things are possibly temporary uh, in the sense yeah. that there's a very wide flux of sure. how these things go. Yes. So, you know, if you were to complete this 20 years ago uh, or 30 years ago, if you're old like me, you would have probably filled this out differently. Your, your values and where you invest your attention, of course, changes over time. Of course, this is a dynamic picture. We're just taking a snapshot here. So yes, people are born, people die, people come into your life, people leave, and things change. Opportunities arise and things change. Disappointments occur, tragedy occurs, and things change, and so you shift constantly, of course. It is a changing picture. What else did you discover? What other insights or questions come out of this? Yes. Oh, en español. Gracias. Sí. Bueno, pues hemos descubierto que hace falta valentía para poder hacer cambios. Can you translate that for me? You need to be brave to make changes and then advance in your life. You need to be brave to make changes. Yes, we, we heard from that young man who said bravery is what's important. And yes, uh, thank you. The, it takes courage to try new things. And perhaps as you were speaking just now, you felt a little anxious, wondering, gee, could I, could I do this? Could I, could I try something different? It requires courage because any time you try to change something, as I said earlier, there is the risk of failure. And all of us, as leaders, must know this. So how do you find the strength, the courage, the bravery to try something new? Well, there are, there are a couple of very important things that, that we need to keep in mind and that this model, which I am now going to tell you a little bit more about, helps you to do. The first is, when you try something new, it should be very small. It should be something that you can do, not something too big. Because if it's too big and there's too much at risk, you will be frozen with fear and you will not move. So you have to adjust your first step so that it is small enough to take. The other, this is the theory of small wins on which this whole model of change is based. You take a small step toward a big idea. The other, of course, is to have other people helping you. Leadership is something that must be done with other people. This is obvious, but it's important to say. You cannot do this alone. No one can. Everyone needs support. And the more you can enlist other people to give them power, to help them see that what you are doing is good for them as well as for you, the more likely it is that they will give you support and help you and want you to succeed. And that helps to overcome the fear of trying something new. What else? I would love to hear one or two other comments before I tell you a little bit more about how this whole thing works. Senor. Yes, in my case, the more importance and the more focus I give, the more satisfaction and performance I get, and vice versa. The, the, the better the performance. Yes. 
So the things that are important that you focus on, yes, you're, you're going to feel better and you're probably going to perform better. Uh, so, so of course, this raises the question, are you putting your attention on the, the things that matter? And that is the goal, is to take realistic, practical steps to make small changes that enable you to do what you care about, to align your values and your actions. Even if it is a small step, when you do this, and we have discovered this and researched this, thousands of people, and, and the, the, uh, the 130,000 students that you spoke about, those were people who, who took my, my MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course. Uh, there have been a few thousand at the Wharton School, but the 100 plus thousand did this course electronically. In fact, there are some of you in this room who have taken that course uh, in this massive open online environment. And what we see, again, is that it is the small step toward a big idea that gives people a sense of courage. Let me hear one other comment or observation from this conversation. I'm very curious to know, was it uncomfortable or was it okay to have this conversation? Perhaps you will address this or something else. That was something else. It, was, it has to do with the last column. You said performance had to do with what others look of us or think of us. And the interesting thing for me, I did it with my wife, and I thought I was going to be perfect uh, thinking what others see of me. She says, are you crazy? This is not you. <laughs> wow. So it, it was nice seeing how, how much we don't know uh, ourselves. That is the perfect um, uh, setup for, for what I now want to describe. I want to, yes, we can easily deceive ourselves. And as leaders, we cannot afford to do that. So how do you get the real picture? All right, let, let me tell you a little bit more about how this works, and then I will stop and take, take your, more, your further questions. Thank you for doing this. I hope that you found it interesting to talk about this and that you were able to do it. Well, be, before I talk about that, it seemed to me that most of you actually had this conversation. You did, you did this. And most people find that it's, it's, it's interesting and it's not that difficult to do. And some people find that when they have this kind of conversation, they realize, well, he is struggling with this question just as I am. That we're all, rest we're all trying to get a better harmony, better integration. And when you realize that, you feel better. You feel better because you realize this is not just me. This is us, and we can help each other through this kind of dialogue. <laughs> If there's one thing that you take away from this, I hope that is a part of what you are thinking. Talking about these issues as we are, and which I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to do with you, this is the most important aspect of this work. Conversation with people who you care about. So the big idea is to go from thinking about one-way wins to four-way wins. And I will just say that very quickly, that instead of thinking about just this part, how can you make change that will capture all the different parts? That's all I want to say about that here. And because I want to take you through how this, what's in this book. So now here's the three minute version of that book in front of you. Um, <clears throat> what we've talked about so far is the beginning. So there's these three principles uh, to be real, say the verdad, to be truthful. And this, this is about acting with authenticity by clarifying what matters most to you. So you just did one of the exercises that's in the book, but there are other things that you can do, and what I recommend you try doing if you're interested in learning more. One of the exercises is called your leadership vision. Perhaps you have done something like this. With the leadership vision, you write in one page, describe a day in your life 15 years from now. So imagine it is March 17, 2031. You wake up. Who are you with? <laughs> what do you do in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening? What does that day look like? 
And most importantly, what is the impact that you're having with your life? Why does it matter? Leadership vision, your picture of the future that you aspire to. Every leader must have that. And if you have no idea, if you're 30 years old and you have no idea what you're doing next weekend, you know, you don't have any idea, well then imagine, use your creative imagination and speak to what is in your heart about what you would like to be doing and what you would like to be achieving in terms of your impact. <clears throat> Another exercise uh, that I recommend you try is about the critical episodes in your life history. What are the three or four events that have occurred in your life that have turned you into the person you are, that changed you, that made you who you are, that you are willing to share? Because there are things that have happened to you that you don't want to talk about. But what has happened that you can talk about that speaks to how you have come to believe what you believe in? Everybody has that. That's your leadership story. And what we have seen time and time again is that when you are able to tell that story, if you're an executive, a parent, if you can tell that story to people who look up to you, to people that you want to build trust with, they will see that you have struggled just like them, that you have failed and you are still here. And they will come to trust you more because they will see in you what they see in themselves, which is a human being who is trying, trying to do things and dealing with the, the difficult world around you. So when you connect your history with your future, this is the narrative that helps you to articulate what do you stand for, what do you care about, what does it mean for you to be real, your truth. And as a leader, and as someone interested in creating greater harmony, you have to have this, or at least some version of it. And when you share that with your colleagues, and they give you feedback, as you just did here, and they ask you questions because they care about helping you, you discover more, and you become more clear and confident in your own values and vision. So that's where it begins. And that's really where it ends. What matters to you? Most important. The second part is to be whole. So this involves, se completo, to act with integrity, respecting the whole person. And it's, it's an extension of what you just began here. Who are the most important people at your work, at your home, and in your community? What do those people expect of you? What do you expect of them? You started to do this just now. How well are you performing in meeting their expectations? Where is there conflict between what your family expects of you and what your work expects of you and what your friends expect of you and what you expect of yourself? And this is where the magic starts to happen. Where is there compatibility? How is what your family wants from you the same as what your employer wants, your friends, what you want for yourself? And how does all of that fit with what you stand for, your values, your vision? These are questions every leader must ask. And to integrate the different parts of life, you have to address these questions. Then the second part of this be whole section, this is chapter five in the book, is to have conversations with those stakeholders. Dialogue, where you discover that what you thought is not what she thought. And usually, usually, not always, but usually what other people expect of you is less than, menos, less than what you think they expect. I don't know if that's true here. <laughs> and I don't want to know. <laughs> but that is usually what happens. The people who love you, who care about you, who want you to thrive, who want you to be successful, they expect less of you than you think. And what you discover is that they expect less and a little bit different. So when you have that conversation and you say, Susanna, you're one of the most important people in my life. 
Of course, this is very awkward since I don't even know you, but I know your name. So we're pretending, we're pretending. Here's what I think is important to you. Do I have this right? And you would say, well, I'm very glad we're having this conversation. I'm so glad I'm important to you. That's very good to know. So if you do, if you do just that, leaving this room, you tell the people who matter to you that they really matter to you, that is free, costs you nothing, and it gains you a great deal. Of course, you have to mean it. You have to, you have to be honest and be uh, you know, sincere. You're one of the most important people to me. Here's what I think is, I want to strengthen our future. Would you be willing to talk with me about that? What would you say, Suzanne? Of course you would. You would be happy to do this. So then I say, well, here's what I think is important to you. Do I have it right? And you would probably say to me, well, not exactly. I say to you, these are the four things that I think are most important to you. A, B, C, D. You say to me, well, Stu, the first two things that you mentioned, very important. And if you had not mentioned them, I would think that there was something wrong. You must know that these two things are very important to me. But these two things, C and D, not so much. Not a, not a mucho. Not important. Wow, really? I thought these were very important to you. You say, no. Why is that, Susanna? Tell me more. And so she can see that I'm very open, I'm inquiring, I'm listening, I'm not trying to be defensive, I'm just interested in your perspective, how you see me. I'm doing what I call, I'm taking the leadership leap. I'm putting myself in her head, trying to see myself through her eyes. The hardest thing to do as leaders is to see others, see ourselves as others see us. It's very difficult as you just proved. <laughs> so she can see that I'm open and that I'm inquiring, that I'm asking, and, and she'll, she'll say to me, well, there's something else that you didn't mention in those four that is very important to me. And I say, well, tell me more. Tell me more. And she tells me this other thing that I didn't even know about. Why is that important to you, Suzanne? How can I help you with that? So it goes on like this. Now imagine if you had a dozen such conversations, 10, do, uh, once, doce uh, conversations, just like that. Because what you discover just in that conversation is uh, this was what was in my head. I had these four things that I was worried about before I had this conversation. Then I had this conversation and I, I lose those two, no longer worried about those because they don't matter to her. And I learned something new. So I went from this to this. What does that mean for how I feel and how I think? How has it changed? How has my psychology changed? Por favor, dígame. Right, tell me. How are things different if you go from having this in your head to having this in your head? One less, thank you. That's good, Carlos. <laughs> Cuatro menos uno igual tres. There's one less, but seriously, that's a little less stress. What else is different? What else is different? Okay, well, en español, you're not even following me. Señora. You're probably going to feel more comfortable that you know better that person and that you can actually uh, deal with her, I mean, not deal, but uh, yeah, yeah, deal with her and, and her issues that are important for her and that you, that you already know. Exactly. I've become smarter now. I'm more intelligent about how to meet her expectations. I have less stress and I'm smarter. This sounds pretty good, right? You can do this. I just did it. <laughs> It's a little more complicated than that. And the way I would talk to my brother is different than I would talk to my partner because he's different. And so I have to find a way to connect with my brother that is different than how I connect with my partner, than my wife. We speak differently. And that's part of the leadership challenge here is how you connect with people and find out what they really care about. But usually it results in less stress and better intelligence about what you need to focus on. So again, you start to think, what can I do differently now? 
to align my actions with my values and with the values of people around me. And that leads to the third piece, which is to be innovative. I'm almost done, I promise, and then we will, we will speak. We will have conversation, if, as time permits. Yep. To be innovative, to act with creativity by continually experimenting with how things get done. And this is the fun part. What we've been talking about here is pretty much the depressing part, right? Oh, I'm, not, I'm not doing well enough here. Oh, there's so much I need to change. I'm afraid. How can I do this? Well, the people who are very good at this, and anyone can learn these skills, which is why I'm here speaking to you, and why we wrote this book, anyone can learn these skills to try something small that enables you to live in a way that's closer to your values and meets the needs and expectations of the people around you. So people experiment. And the people who are very good at this, they're constantly experimenting. And they do all kinds of things. Like, for example, you discover that you need to take care of your body because you are, you are, you are, you're, you're not healthy. And you find out that your family wants you to be healthier, your boss wants, to be healthier, <laughs> wants you to be healthier, your friends want you to be healthier, and you want to be healthier. So okay, I'm going to take care of myself in a way that I haven't before because everybody around me wants, to do, wants me to do that for them. I'll be less of a healthcare risk for my employer. I will be less grouchy or cranky when I'm around my friends because I'll feel better. And for my grandchildren, I will live longer to be with them. Everybody wants that. So then it becomes a matter not just of taking care of yourself so your clothes fit better, but you're doing this to be a better employee, a better father, a better friend. You're doing this change for yourself that serves other people. Other ideas that come to mind, and there have been literally tens of thousands of experiments that people do, they will delegate in a new way. So you discover that someone who works for you wants to do a part of your job. And they're ready to try that. And so you, you try a small experiment where here's, you can try this one piece of my job that gives me freedom to do other things. And it helps you to grow. Another common kind of experiment these days is to try having a conversation without your smartphone in front of you. Can you try that? You think you could try that? What imp and you can't do that? Well, some people discover, you know, they hear feedback from people in these dialogues. You know, I don't think you really care very much about me because whenever we're together, your mind is elsewhere, you're looking at your smartphone, you're having another conversation. So you realize, I need to change that. How would I do that? Well, perhaps I'll try one conversation per day. This is the whole experiment. One conversation where you do not have your smartphone anywhere nearby. Do you think you could try that? All right. So that's how you overcome the fear. You make it small. With one investment bank that I was working with uh, not too long ago, one person's experiment was uh, to not have her smartphone in the shower. <laughs> that, seriously, that was a stretch goal. Um, <laughs> So, so this, I mean, this is just a couple of examples. Other, I'm going to give you uh, just a few other examples, but that is the idea. You try some experiments where the goal is to make things better in all the different parts, and some experiments w work and some do not. But the idea is to try something that you can do, that other people want you to do, that helps you to perform well in all the different parts of your life and that are consistent with your values and your beliefs. That's it. And so then you try it for a month or so. And I'll give you some more examples of the different kinds of experiments shortly. But what we find, well, I'll, t I'll tell you one other, and this is one I, I described at lunch. Let's say, um, let's say, Suzanne, um, to stay with you, I'm, forgive me. Let's say you're my boss. And I say, Suzanne, what I would like to try is uh, for the next month, uh, I would like to be away from work on Wednesday afternoon after 4 p.m. Because I believe that I will perform better at work as a result of my being away from work at that time because I will take care of something that's very important in my family 
that is bothering me that I think about all the time and I'll be able to take care of that so I'll be more focused and you will see an improvement in my performance over the next month. Would you be willing to try that for just one month? And if it doesn't work out, we'll go back to the way things are now, which is you have my entire life and all I do is respond to your needs. Maybe you wouldn't say that, but you, but you get, let's just try that. Would you be willing to try that for a month? Why would you be willing to try that? You trust me, but I'm also doing it to make things better for you. This is not just for me and my family, it's for you. And this is the idea, to be thinking of yourself as a leader, having other people be successful as a result of actions you're taking. Not, it's not about you, it's about us. When you take this approach and you try this and then you see what worked and what did not as I tried to create change, as I took steps with new power to try to create change, people start to feel differently about themselves. They feel more purposeful, more supported, uh, more curious and engaged and they feel more powerful in trying to create meaningful change. They feel more confident and competent as leaders. All right, I must wrap up. Um, so it goes through these different phases and we have these symbols for what it means to be real, to be whole, to be innovative. Uh, results, let me finish with this. Results. We have studied this and what we find in general is that when you take this approach of asking people to make real change that benefits their work and the other parts of their lives, that not surprisingly, that's what happens. Uh, we see benefits in both parts, uh, the different parts of life. And so in one study, in one study, we asked people uh, four months later. So what I just described to you, usually we spend about four months on this over you know, a couple of hours a week, like my Coursera course on the MOOC. Uh, that was 10 weeks. Looking at what it means to be real. Who are the most important people? Being whole, having those conversations, and then spending a month or so with a couple of different experiments small steps towards becoming the leader you want to become, small steps towards aligning your actions and your values. And so this is four months later, before and after. So you just did the before, the pre, and then four months later, we asked people the same question. This was a study done with 300 business professionals, different industries, the average age was 35. And here's what we see. Look at the first column and the second column, pre and post, What's important? How do you compare before and after in terms of values? What's the difference? There's no difference. It's the same. So your values over four months don't change. Over four years or four decades, they do. So again, there's no drugs here, there's no surgery, there's, there's not a cult, there's no magic here. Your values are the same. But now let's look at the second column. Where is your attention? What do you see comparing those two before and after with respect to your attention? What do you see? Better alignment. Yes, and how does that happen? What, what, is, the, what is the change that occurs? Susanna. you're more focused on the parts of life other than work. This seems unrealistic. You could never do this here. You can do this here. Small steps. You focus less attention to work. Now I know that there are some people thinking, wait, is this what they're teaching at the Wharton School? Less work? <laughs> it is what we are teaching at the Wharton School and many other places. Why? Because, let's look at the other, the other results. Satisfaction, that is a delta, that's a change score, that's a positive change score on, those, on that same scale that I asked you to rate before. You see satisfaction goes up in all the different parts, especially in the self, because that is usually rated lowest, and so the gains are greater. But we also asked people to have their key people, their stakeholders, rate how well they're doing, just as I asked you to think about earlier. 
And what we see there, it's a smaller effect, but still, there is a gain in performance, in meeting expectations in all four domains, including work. Now, if you don't trust these data and you want to talk to me about the methods, I'd be happy to do that. But for now, trust me, that these are reliable findings. Less attention to work. Less attention to work, better performance at work. That's what we observe. That is a paradox, is it not? Yes. How do you explain that? Because that is what we see. Less attention to work and better performance in meeting the expectations of key people at work. How do you explain that? Sir? Less distraction when you work, you're more focused and concentrating what you are supposed to do you, because you, are, you have dedicated more time to the other valuable parts of your life. So they are well dedicated. Exactly. You are less distracted and more focused on the things that matter to Susanna and to whoever. You become smarter about focusing and you are less worried, less psychological interference. That is the technical term. Your mind is not distracted as much because you're focused on the things that matter in all the different parts. That's the essence of it. All right, I am definitely beyond time. I have to conclude here. Um, so, so why don't I leave it at that? Uh, the, the different kinds of experiments are described in the book. Um, there are many, many different kinds of experiments. There are nine different kinds that our research team found when we, when we looked at the first thousand or so experiments. What do people do? Well, they organize their time differently. They take care of themselves in ways that are new. Um, they, they delegate differently. They focus their attention on one person at a time. Or they reveal aspects of themselves. They take that leadership vision and they share it with other people. Some people start writing a journal. Uh, but in all cases, the goal is to make things better at work, at home, in the community, and for themselves. And that is what we see happening. So I, I want to bring us to a close here so I have some time for some, some questions uh, that you will moderate, Vicente. Uh, let, me, uh, let me just thank you for your attention here and ask you to once again remember the idea is to aim for the possible realistic practical steps you can take to produce value in the different parts of your life by trying to learn these principles and the skills of being real being whole, being innovative. We know that anyone can learn these skills and that the investment in doing so brings value not just to yourself, but to your business. At Ford, we demonstrated increased uh, productivity and cost savings and cost reductions, tens of millions of dollars. So this is not just a feel good idea. This is not social welfare. This is a business idea that can help your business and invest in the people. Uh, and when you think about, and this is my final comment, I promise, when you think about what we need to do as leaders in our world, in our world which is very, very broken, which needs to be fixed, I see our responsibility here, while we're here on this earth, to act as leaders to try to heal the world. And my belief is that if you take the view that your job here, your task for each one of us is to create value, not just for our economic life, but for the other parts of our life. If, if more people took this approach, we would have more people trying to do what they can with their talents, their skills, their passions, to, to heal the world and make it a little better for all of us. So I, I hope that's what you will do. Muchas gracias, señoras, señores. Thank you.